Welcome back. We're back now with Kevin Mitnick, perhaps the best-known computer hacker ever, who now has a company that works against malicious hacking. Mr. Mitnick, let's go back to the, uh, let's start at the national level. How vulnerable, in your view, is the United States to a large-scale computer attack by al-Qaeda or any other terrorist group, for that matter? Well, I think the threat of cyber terrorism is uh, quite overblown, but at the same time, I have specific knowledge of our telecommunications infrastructure, and when I was a young kid, I was able to compromise telephone companies throughout the United States. So if a terrorist group wanted to interfere with our telecommunications, I believe it is possible. Will they? Are they interested in disrupt disrupting our economic standing, or are they interested in doing some sort of terrorist attack of symbolism where they're you know blowing up buildings and stuff like that I think it's more the latter but uh, I believe where all businesses are vulnerable including uh, government agencies universities uh, it's all depending on the computer the computers that they're running and the uh, procedures they have in place or security processes so what procedures should be in place what is your advice to companies or individuals out there trying to protect themselves from cyber attacks well, I think it's a mixture of people, of processes, of technology, of security awareness. For example, on the technology level, it's essential that companies be vigilant about patching systems, keeping their operating systems up to date with the latest fixes. Uh, firewalls, having, uh, having a proper configuration, not only of their firewalls, but of any con systems that are attached to the hostile internet. Um, using antivirus software, using in intrusion detection systems, uh, authentication, not using the static password because unfortunately people are not that imag imaginative when they're picking their passwords. So there's different types of devices out there that use time-based tokens or smart cards that ensure authentication. That is, that the person is who they claim to be. Um, you say you have intimate knowledge of the uh, telecommunication system in this nation. How did you gain this knowledge? Well, back before I was involved in ha hacking, I was involved in phone freaking. And phone freaking was kind of hacking the telephone system, and this was back in the late 1970s. Oh my goodness, phone freaking! I you know I had not I had not heard that that term before. In it fact, did, did you know that Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak were phone hackers before they built Apple Computer? That's how they funded building Apple was by selling blue boxes on Berkeley's campus. So what's the point of phone uh, <laughs> freaking? <laughs> so. I'm sorry. What's true. the point? I mean, what are you getting out of it? Just it's just the thrill of, of getting oh, involved in other people's lives. No, no, it has nothing to do with the human being. It's oh. just the the telephone system was amazing. It was the the technology, the, be, the being able to pick up a uh, a telephone handset and call somebody around the world. It was just uh, as a kid, it was just fascinating. Um, as an adult, I'm still in intrigued by the system, the new the new features of the telecommunication systems. But at that time, that was my interest. What what are the threats that the government might be facing in terms of uh, tracking its own people. Uh, tracking, you mean it's uh, internal moles and intelligence That's agencies? That's right. I mean, that's a serious problem. I mean, look at Aldrich James, look at uh, Robert Hansen. Um, in fact, it was kind of interesting because Robert Hansen ran searches on his own name uh, in the computer systems that the, that the FBI uses for investigations. And that should have been a big clue to the people that are in charge of auditing uh, the FBI's, I guess, I don't know what the is I forgot by, by now, but uh, in charge of auditing that particular system. Now, what about your site? You, were you surprised that your own site was actually uh, hacked into? How do you avoid that? How, how, can it, how, how did it happen that hackers actually got into your site? If they're going to hack your site... You really site want to know how to avoid it? Don't run Microsoft Windows. But, <laughs> but besides that, is um, the... Why, why not run Microsoft Windows? Because it's a very buggy operating system, and it's uh, most uh, there's so many vulnerabilities associated with it that it's relatively easy to hack into any Windows system. The people that set up the Defensive Thinking website, it was set up prior to my termination of probation. I wasn't allowed to use computers, so I had some volunteers set up the Defensive Thinking website. Eventually, uh, a few months, as soon as I was off probation, that website that was supported by volunteers, they didn't keep it patched, they didn't keep, they didn't keep it up to date, they weren't vigilant. And a person who goes by the monkeyer bugbear had found a vulnerability that wasn't patched and went in and, and, and dropped a file or put a file onto the website, didn't deface the website, but then announced it to the media. So 
Uh, then I went ahead, because I was allowed to use a computer, I fixed the vulnerability, and then I decided I don't want to have to deal with that because I'm too busy supporting our customers. I don't want to have to deal, deal with a website that wasn't even connected to our internal network. It was just, an, just a standalone computer system. So I, I used a hosting company in Kentucky to host the website. About a week later, the hackers had compromised that web hosting's company and did deface the website, but I had no control of it because it was an outside company. Amazing. What about the issue of privacy? In this environment after September 11th, people are, are worried about the, uh, the government spying on, on ordinary citizens. Um, I mean, how do you, how do you uh, control that if it's so easy to get into people's computers? So you're laughing at because it's... Because uh, there is no way. We, uh, right. You have no pri privacy. Get over it. That's Scott McNeely's quote from Sun. I mean, it's true. If you are leading a law-abiding life in... States of America, you have no privacy. Anybody can get your social security number, your mother's maiden name, your address, your telephone number. It would take all about somebody with access to the internet, a credit card, in five minutes of time. Are these companies trying to uh, improve their their uh, security? Is Sun Microsystems doing anything about it? Is Microsoft doing anything about this? You say that it's uh, don't use Microsoft Windows. Well, uh, they are. They're making efforts. Uh, now they're taking security more seriously. Before it was interoperability. Inter interoperability and functionality, and hopefully uh, companies will make it a pri priority. It depends on the market. If consumers demand secure, you know, um, software that doesn't contain a lot of security holes, then the manufacturers are going to meet their customer needs. If not, then they're going to continue to release software that contains vulnerabilities that people will be able to exploit. Mr. Mitnick, it was really good to have you tonight. Now I know we all have no privacy. <laughs> Windows, Microsoft, Sun Microsystems quote. Wow. Very, uh, very enlightening tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you. Kevin Mitnick, author of The Art of Deception. Good luck with the book. Founder of cybersecurity's firm, Defensive Thinking.